Hey guys we are gonna see what if story so please leave a like what if Naruto x Cynthia x Diantha x Harem movie. Haven't watched the earlier arcs in a long time. Johto, Kanto and Hoenn so forgive me for any mistakes. This will be a light, not dark or grey Pokemon fanfic. Meaning that there will be no plot device where the evil mastermind has some sort of ingenious plan which he mentions every cliffhanger in order to make the readers feel a sense of dread involving double crossing, rapes, deaths on screen, traps that lead to deaths, there will be close calls here and again, like in the Pokemon movies but that's it. I do not write emo MCs. Legendaries are actually godlike or OP at least in this FIC, there can only be one legendary of a species e.g., one Lugia, one Darkrai, one Mew in one generation. There can be baby legendaries if Arceus allows it but only one at a time. Seriously legendaries are underpowered in the movies that it's kind of pointless to call them legendaries if normal Pokemon can beat them often, make no mistake, legendaries can be beaten except it's pisser hard even for the elite four and that's for the mid-tier ones like Deoxy. It is possible to 1v1 low-tier legendaries and win, but it usually takes elite four level Pokemon. It is possible to beat mid-tier legendaries and win, but they are so strong they can beat three elite four Pokemon before fainting. There will be no bullshit electrocution device or grappling machine that can somehow detain a legendary unless it's something natural like the red chain produced by the three lake spirits or special tunes, music, songs for certain Pokemon. Charizard will be badass. End of discussion. Followed closely by Pikachu. Also end of discussion. These two will be with Naruto before he turns into a trainer and they have unique, special abilities that will make them op later in the series maybe at the end of Johto or in the middle of Hoenn, especially Charizard I've got something special planned for him. Mega evolutions will not play a huge role until after Johto maybe, they will have been discovered at the start of this series, but it's not up to the point where significant foes, like every gym leader or elite trainers can use them yet. In this FIC Charizard, with the exception of Naruto's Charizard, can only turn to Mega Charizard X, I have something special for the Mega Charizard Y form and that form won't be introduced till Hoenn, I've always found it weird that Mega Charizard X was the Dragon Type 1 instead of Charizard Y, don't get me wrong, the black and blue is an awesome touch and it makes him look like a badass but quite frankly Mega Charizard Y looks more draconic, so both Charizard Mega Evolutions will be Dragon Type. Whirlpool Company, will replace Sylph Company. Comma comma comma, main pairing. Narutox Cynthia x Diantha, I can add others. I swap the two Mewtwo's that currently exist around, the one in the first movie and the second one in the Genesect movie, meaning that the female one that can use the Y Mega Evolution will be the one that Ash meets first in New Island and the temporarily batshit crazy, revenge obsessed one presented in the first movie will be introduced later, both of them can Mega Evolve. Here is how the power rankings go from the strongest to weakest. 1. Arceus. 2. High Tier Legendaries. The huge ones like Palkia, Dialga, Garidina, Groudon, Rayquaza, Kyogre, Dao Trio, Zekrom, Reshiram and Kurum. Mega Mewtwo. Mew. None are obtainable, only Naruto can use or capture them. 3. Mid-tier legendaries. Trio Masters. Regigas, Lugia, Ho-Oh. Lunar Duo. Darkrai, Eon Duo. Latios and Latias. Mewtwo. Deoxy. Celebi. Force of Nature Trio. Obtainable by normal people. Eon Duo. Force of Nature Trio. Lunar Duo. 4. Low-tier legendaries. Articuno. Zapdos. Moltres. The Regis. Entei. Suicune. Raiko. Obtainable by normal people. Every low-tier legendary. 5. Champion level Pokemon. 6. Elite 4 level Pokemon. 7. Elite level Pokemon. And so on. So, enjoy the prologue. This chapter consists of basically the important moments in Naruto's life from 6 to 10 before he becomes a trainer, so there will be a lot of time skips and there may be moments where you are lost and have no idea where Naruto is or what he is doing, I will try my best to be as descriptive as possible. Now without further introduction, enjoy. Prologue. The Uzumaki meets the Mew duo. The vast sea surrounding the massive body of steel was beautiful as well as refreshing with the Wingulls flying about in the cool breeze while the Magikarp as well as other water Pokemon, swam freely in the ocean. In this day and age, ships were becoming a more popular means of transport, preferred more so over transport via Pokemon back in the old days when Pokemon and humans coexisted without the aid of technology. On one particular ship, there was a boy hanging onto the rails as he looked forward, eternally awestruck by the dazzling view of the ocean as it sparkled beautifully in the morning light, completely unaware that a woman was sneaking up on him before she embraced him lovingly. Naruto how do you like the ocean? Mom, it's so beautiful, it's my first time ever seeing something so beautiful. 
Right. I was just like you the first time I went overseas. Just think Naruto. We're almost there. It's so exciting. We'll be meeting new Pokemon, new friends, new sites and we'll have a new home for just the six of us. Me, you, Mr. Mime, Charmander, Pikachu and Torchic. Yeah, I can't wait to meet Professor Oak. He's a friend of Mr. Gherkin, right? He's gotta be awesome. Back in his homeland he had previously lived in Shalaur City and was taught about Pokemon and advanced school subjects, which he picked up really easily, under the tutelage of Gherkin, the head of the Tower of Mastery, alongside his granddaughter, Karina, who he was really close with, closer than most best friends even. Gherkin had made brief mentions of other professors, mostly about Professor Oak and Sycamore during his lectures about legendary Pokemon from other regions. It was also the place where he got his Torchic, Gherkin gave the Pokemon as well as a special, a really special stone to him as a farewell present. For years it was a tradition to give the next successor of the Tower of Mastery a strong Riolu that had the potential to mega evolve in its fully evolved state. Originally he was offered position at the Tower in the future but had to decline due to moving overseas, but nonetheless Gherkin gave him a Torchic as well as the Blaziconite for future use, the Torchic was a baby that hatched from an egg that originated from Gherkin's Blaziken. He was an awesome dude, especially with his Mega Blaziken and Mega Lucario, Gherkin was basically one of the three most important role models in his life. Gherkin for his scientific knowledge on Pokemon and evolution, Lance for his battle prowess and his mom for normal day hobbies ranging from cooking, gardening and an immense appreciation for the beauty of life. It was a shame that he couldn't stay, apparently no other region other than Kalos had a passable understanding of Mega Evolution and so they weren't capable of using it on a commercialized scale just quite yet, that and he couldn't stay with Karina anymore which resulted in a tearful parting between the two best friends. Let's go mom, Pikachu, Charmander and Torchic are waiting at the grass deck up top, I want to play tag with them. Sure thing, dear, just let me get some some food for you boys, eat first then you can play. Sure thing, mom, well, at least he still had mom and his Pokemon. They were the only important figures left in his life, especially Charmander and Pikachu, he could just, relate to them, simply because their situations were so similar. In his Pokemon's case it was their former trainers abandoning them, in his case, it was his father abandoning him and his mom and regardless of his reasons he didn't give a crap for the man anymore despite having a hardcore hero worship over him a few years ago. Don't be mistaken, he didn't hate his father in fact he respected his father's skills greatly he just no longer saw him as a father figure. Just some impressive trainer like Lance or something, after all he was the greatest Kalos champion in history, often labeled as the greatest trainer in the world after beating nearly every other champion in the world like Lance, Blue, Steven, Wallace and Alder, but he gave up that title and his family in favor of reaching the top of the world, literally. He had met the young lizard, two years ago when he was six, laying weakly on a rock during one of his daily walks, in a nutshell, some retard of a trainer named Damien, incidents as to how he befriended Charmander and Pikachu are the same as in canon with Ash except this takes place in Kalos instead of Kanto, who was really crap at Pokemon battling and had blamed Charmander for that. That guy was such a pathetic trainer which was why the Kalos League had revoked the bastard's trainer license after he had reported a case of abuse involving Damien, even now he held a serious distaste for that guy, or anyone else who would abandon their Pokemon for that matter. But going back to Charmander, the lizard was waiting for a long time for its master, Damien, even when he didn't show up, Charmander just waited patiently there, you got to respect that amount of loyalty, especially when it's for some asshole like Damien. On the day he had met Charmander, it was raining and the Pokemon was on the verge of dying, despite the Pokemon's refusal to be carried to a Pokemon center, he had carried the weakened and tired Pokemon there with its arm around his shoulders while its head lay weakly on his right shoulder despite its intense stare. Albeit the journey was slow with some serious difficulty on his part, even though he was quite active and tall for a normal six-year-old, carrying a Pokemon around was still extremely difficult, especially when it was reluctant to even go with you. Well, that was until the pair had come across Charmander's former trainer. The Pokemon had tried running back to its master but before it could, it had coincidentally heard Damien's confession to his lackeys that he had abandoned released Charmander which had brought the Pokemon onto the verge of tears, Charmanders were renowned to be especially tough, spirited and loyal, especially in its evolved state, there have been some exceptions but that's only in the cases when you're a really, really bad trainer. To see such a strong Pokemon nearly cried you to the one it was fiercely loyal to had caused something in him to snap that day. The details were foggy, seriously he couldn't remember much after that. 
but apparently a few minutes after he saw Charmander crying he had done something to Damien and his three lackeys in the interval of his apparent blackout because the very next day when he had met Damien again in the Pokemon Center the dude was shit scared of him and the bastard was full of bruises. And Charmander had somehow changed his affections and loyalty from Damien to him effectively becoming his new best friend, buddy for the next two years shortly before Pikachu came along and joined the growing family. He could still remember the turning point in the Pokemon Center where they were both lying on the recovery beds next to each other as he stood up, a bit shaky at first but he managed, and sat next to the Charmander and spoke while making a small grin. XXXXX flashback begin XXXXX. Charmander gazed curiously at him, not moving. Naruto's grin only grew larger. He pulled out an empty Pokeball and held it up to Charmander. I know it's hard, being abandoned by your trainer. It'll hurt for a while, but eventually you'll just have to move on. I've been on that path myself. I know the pain you're feeling and I know just how long it takes to get over the heartache. That's why, if you'll let me, I just want you to know, it'll be there for you for every step of the way. The Charmander lying on the bed was starting to tear up now. This show of compassion was something that it just wasn't used to. I want, to help you move on, I want to help you prove your trainer was wrong, because deep down there, I can see a strong, compassionate, loyal Pokemon, one with so much potential, you just have to grab it, and that's why I want to help you. Charmander was now shaking slightly, desperately holding in its tears. Because that's what best friends do, right? Charmander was now crying hysterically, it leapt from the bed and into his arms as it hugged him tightly, crying on his shoulders at the same time as if afraid that this was a dream that this was too good to be true, he patted Charmander's head reassuringly. No matter how many Pokemon I get in the future, I will never exclude you. I'll cherish you unconditionally forever, but I can't promise you a pain-free world. Best friends till the end, well prove that Damien wrong and I'll make you become the very best, a legend, no, a god amongst your species and then one day you'll return to Cherisific Valley a Charizard and make yourself king, with your head held high and proud, together, I know that I can help you get there. He held out a Pokeball, that his mother had given him in preparation for this, he just never expected a chance like this to come so early. Despite that I've never had a Pokemon before, despite that I've never entered a battle before I know we can get to the top, together, the training won't be easy, but it will make you strong, so what do you say? Will you join me as we accomplish our dreams? As you become the greatest Pokemon to ever exist, standing by my side as I become the greatest trainer to ever exist. Wordlessly. Charmander tapped the small white circle with fierce determination as it nodded before turning into a red light and entered the Pokeball. He and Charmander knew it, tasted almost, they were destined for greatness and together, they would become legends. XXXXX flashback and XXXXX. That incident had made himself aware of. Special powers that he discovered had first appeared during the day he had unconsciously lashed out at Damien. He had only found out a year ago because his powers were apparently growing allowing him to have some sort of mental link with the Pokemon that had allowed him to sense their emotions, and if he was close enough to the Pokemon then it would allow him to communicate properly with them in rare cases of stress such as the case with Charmander and later on, Pikachu. His meeting with Yellow Mouse was even more dangerous, for Pikachu that is, than the one with Charmander. XXXXX flashback begin XXXXX. The Yellow Rodent was attacked by a huge flock numbering up to a hundred probably, of Spiros with a Fero leading them, and was running away from them due to their overwhelming numbers until it came across him and Charmander training vigorously in a nearby field. He had tried to rescue the yellow Pokemon at first, and though the two had put up a good fight against the Spiros, they too were eventually tired out due to their sheer number. When Charmander and Pikachu looked like they were about to get killed by the Spiros, he had blocked their path by getting in front of them and hugging the two tired Pokemon protectively, the birds, disliking that someone got in the way had set their sights on him pecking him painfully in a rapid pace. When all hope seemed lost, something strange happened to the Charmander and he could feel something different about himself as well, at the same time, it was raining just like it did back then when he had saved Charmander. Like back then, there was a strange, suffocating tension in the air. He could feel tightness in his chest just begging to be released, to explode at his enemies, the Charmander in his arms was clawing violently at his shoulders as a beastly, almost dragon-like growling could be heard from the lizard Pokemon, its claws were growing slightly longer, its teeth sharpening, the fire on its tail glowing brightly with vigor as it transformed from the size of a small ember to one matching a campfire. If he was a noob back then, he would have mistaken it for the Blaze ability, but Blaze only affected their fire capabilities and usually not to this degree for a Charmander, not to mention Blaze doesn't transform their physical appearance at all. 
The scales on its body became more visibly especially on its forearms, forelegs and the area surrounding the eyes no longer hidden in sight due to its orange tan, eyes which became a slotted crimson as the two corners of its mouth was lit by fire, exactly like Mega Charizard X. The claws, the scales, the teeth, they reminded him so much, of a dragon, but that was impossible right? Charmanders were only fire types, Charizard were fire and flying types, only Mega Charizard were dragon types but they were blue, even their scales weren't as easy to see as Charmander's scales are now. Roa. Opening its mouth, Charmander made the loudest roar he had ever heard even from the ones belonging to conference participants, effectively blowing away all the Spiros, the Firo and even his trainer. The killer intent was tremendous, but it was coupled with something else, determination. I have to protect Naruto, have to protect Naruto, have to protect, ha, Beitu, protect, my friend. Wait he could hear the thoughts of his Pokemon now. When did this happen? Had this battle somehow evolved his abilities? There was several small ponds forming near their position, which he took advantage of. Looming right above one, he gazed upon his mirror image, holding the injured Pikachu, and one difference he spotted was obviously his eyes, what used to be light brown was now a blazing blue, the brightest hue he had ever seen as several green lines danced in his pupils like fireworks, think of an innovator's eyes except blue and green in Gundam 00. He looked back to his Pokemon, Charmander, as it smashed its feet against the ground, entering a stance as if it was about to pounce ferociously on the dozens of birds still active, still numbering around 30 to 40, even meters away, he could still feel the anger emanating from it, he could tell, the enemy could tell, anyone within a mile radius could tell, shit was about to hit the fan. Re, Bay, Dawes, Durndal, what the heck? Charmander's mind was so full of pure hatred that its mental thoughts were incoherent to him, he had to instinctively close his eyes and ears, in an act to protect himself from too much exposure to that, primal fury. Raspa, Rab B H S A H H H H H. Releasing an almost ear-shattering battle cry, Charmander leapt at the nearest Spiro fully intent on shredding the bird to bits, three Spiros went to aid it, but Charmander had already, to everyone's surprise, made contact with the Spiro as its claws sank into its body, slashing across its body effectively knocking it out. Quickly setting its sight on the next three, running, which looked more like jumping at a fast pace almost, it swung its tails colliding instantaneously with the Spiro on the right, the tail that lit up with a blue light was what shocked him. Dragon Tail how does a Charmander know Dragon Tail, he hadn't had Charmander for at least a month. Charmanders and even most of the Dragon-type species in their baby forms like Gibble or Dratini are physically incapable of learning any Dragon-type moves through natural means with the exception of Dragon Rage, so how the heck does a Charmander know how to do it when it hasn't even had any training beforehand? While in his state of shock, Charmander's belly bloated a bit as it sucked in a whole lot of air cocking its head backwards, several of the Spiros used gust but just as the strikes of wind were about to hit Charmander, the fire Pokemon unleashed a huge torrent of fire, bigger than ever before, as it doubled in size after cutting through the air attacks with each blow of wind gradually strengthening its firepower. Eventually the flamethrower attack engulfed several, almost a dozen, Spiro as they fell back to the trees behind them resulting in the trees burning alongside them, in the end as the fire cooled down quickly from the flames, there were several mildly charred birds lying around, fainted. Still in that berserk model, he leapt across the plain field fully intent on taking down the next group, but due to tunnel vision, Charmander didn't see the Firo, the leader of the flock, come in from the left as it aerial aced Charmander. Though Charmander was sent off course, it didn't dishearten for a second, more like it just got more pissed if the sudden ferocious roar was any indication. Firo sent a thunder shock attack at him while Charmander's claws went neon blue, cocking its arm back, Charmander thrust its claws forward and smacked the electric attack down onto the ground, that move was Dragon Claw much to his shock and awe, following up with a flamethrower. A plume of fire flew up towards the Firo. Dodging it, Firo flew to the side only to be greeted with a barrage of ember attacks which were as big as Charmander itself, though its attempts to doge the fire blasts were admirable. Eventually one of the blasts singed its feathers causing the large bird to flinch. This diversion created an opportunity for Charmander as it renewed its onslaught of fire attacks. Before Firo could regain its momentum in the air, the fire blasts slammed into the bird repeatedly causing one mild explosion after another until the bird fell to the ground causing a huge crater and cloud of dust to appear obviously disguising a fainted Pokemon shard to quite an extent. Seeing their leader beaten so easily, the other Spiros flew, too scared to face the enraged Charmander, not bothering, too scared to notice that the red aura surrounding Charmander was quickly dissipating. As soon as the coast was clear, Charmander looked over to its trainer, weakly holding up a thumb before it dropped to the floor unconscious. That scene snapped him out of shock, 
quickly running to Charmander with Pikachu laying weakly in his arms. He sent Charmander back into his Pokeball as well as Pikachu much to his reluctance, he wasn't a fan of capturing a Pokemon against its will no matter how rare it was, if he could, he would beat the Pokemon first and ask whether or not the Pokemon would want to join him in order to get stronger together, but this situation called for it, the Pokeballs delayed their status, be it poisoned or fainted, the Pokemon would suffer at a slower rate. Running immediately to the local Pokemon Center, he begged Nurse Joy to heal the two critically injured Pokemon, it would take a while but they would recover Nurse Joy told him, relieving his fears almost immediately. Gherkin and his mother had heard the news about the attack after Nurse Joy gave them a call and recounted his story, though he had quickly reassured the frantic mother that everything would be okay, he told a different story to Gherkin. Gherkin soon became intrigued about the battle between Charmander and Firo, he too realized that the power-up Charmander experienced along with the sudden appearance change wasn't the Blaze ability. Though the old man reassured him it was probably nothing, the man called in a longtime friend Professor Sycamore in order to gain some insight about Charmander's ability. Though Sycamore was pretty uninterested in the topic, Gherkin asked him to take a DNA sample and make an X-ray scan. The result was something none of them were expecting. Later on, when Sycamore returned from his inspection, the look on his face was something akin to awe, shock and that scientific curiosity that every true scientist showed once they had discovered an anomaly or something. The news that Sycamore gave them was shocking and unprecedented in the history of Charmaders everywhere, his Charmander, was a dragon type, a dual fire, dragon type. Scans and DNA testing showed Charmander had a lot of traits that dragon type Pokemon had in common, which was weird, since tests for Charmander before this incident showed it as any other Charmander, a simple fire type lizard looking Pokemon, they chalked this sudden change of DNA structure up to Charmander's new ability. For Sycamore, this was a first, not even his former Charmander was like this, and he so badly wanted to conduct more research on this new and unique specimen of a Charmander, but he knew the boy well enough to know that he would never relinquish his Charmander. Though after Charmander and Pikachu recovered, Sycamore was allowed to conduct practical tests on whether or not he could see the ability for himself, while he, Naruto, checked up on Pikachu after it woke, Pikachu too was abandoned by an amateur trainer simply because he couldn't handle the little dude's attitude and threw him away for the Spearows to attack. Seriously are trainers so lazy and emotionally immature that they can't do a simple one-to-one -one talk to set boundaries and display emotions, forget that Gherkin and his mom both told him that he was way too smart and mature for a six-year-old, on like, every occasion. But in the end, Pikachu was just like Charmander if not more emotionally insecure. The empathy link he had really worked with the one-sided conversation, he had offered the yellow mouse Pokemon a home alongside him and see whether or not it liked it, Pikachu was the type of Pokemon that respected skill, principles and a good moral compass for the well-being of Pokemon, it's only after you show all these pre-requisites that Pikachu would follow you, it's sad that Pikachu's former trainer couldn't realize that. Seriously did every newbie trainer think this was some sort of sick game where the trainer throws a Pokeball and that's it you get an immediately loyal Pokemon? Seriously, Pokemon have feelings too, they want to see the mental strength of their trainers before they actually respect your commands. Going back to Charmander, Sycamore had tried to see this ability for himself but had failed repeatedly, it's kind of hard trying to produce something when you don't know what the prerequisites are, so far, Sycamore treated it like the Blaze ability, which was understandable since Charmander was in a pretty bad condition before it changed, and sent out Garchomp to lower the Charmander's health to just the right amount, but it didn't work, except for the activation of Blaze. But there was a breakthrough some point in the future. Kind of funny how many scientists discovered new theories in Pokemon by accident. After Charmander lost against Garchomp for the millionth time, apparently losing that much times in a row pissed the Fire Lizard, or Dragonoff so much that his second, unknown ability forcibly activated, the fight afterwards was a lot more balanced, Garchomp actually had a hard time beating Charmander, but it still won in the end, seriously a fully evolved Pokemon versus a baby lizard Pokemon, who the hell do you think would win? He and Sycamore face palmed themselves after realizing that this ability activated through immense anger. Sycamore did it because it was the basic principle for fire Pokemon to increase their firepower through rage and anger. Losing a lot of health just aided in this endeavor. Though this, draconic looking ability of this Charmander was a lot more impressive than Blaze. For a one year old Charmander to force Garchomp, whom he had trained for years, to actually fight seriously was no joke. Blaze was a useful ability, sure but it has never been this powerful. Not to mention that Blaze had no part to play in the tremendous increase in Charmander's attack power. Speed and defense, as well as Charmander's sudden knowledge of Dragon-type moves that should be physically impossible for a baby Pokemon, there was not one ability that the professor could think of that allowed Pokemon to just instinctually learn multiple new moves without any practice beforehand, 
there was copycat but Charmander's skill in using his newfound moves were not amateurish to say the least, it had the markings of a Pokemon who's trained for years in those moves. While Sycamore was contemplating this amazing, newfound ability, Naruto face palmed because he remembered the rage that Charmander felt during the fight with the Spearow flock. He had to temporarily disable the connection he had with Charmander in order to not go insane from the sheer anger flowing off his best buddy. Sycamore on the other hand was frantically writing in his observations and later on told him the few specifics he could catch after a few more observations. One unlike Blaze, the power-up Charmander gained from this ability strengthened and hardened the muscles and bones in Charmander's body. Two in terms of fire abilities, Charmander retained a bit of power from the power-up permanently even after the Berserker mode ended, which meant each time it entered this berserk state Charmander's fire type moves like Flamethrower and Ember would increase in power not to mention that the fire lit on Charmander's tail grew a little as well. 3 Charmander was now to be considered a dragon-type Pokemon, the scales on Charmander's body hardened, though they were not as thick and visible during its berserk state, they still increased in defensive capabilities nonetheless. 4 The longer the battle continued, Charmander was increasingly getting stronger, faster, and more, dragon-like. It was because of this that Sycamore, with Gherkin and his approval, and officially coined it as the Dragon Force. Though Sycamore remarked that there may be more functions to this ability, the professor shuddered when he thought about how strong Charmander would be in the future, especially when it's a Charizard using that berserk mode. His Garchomp which was high tier elite level was already having a hard time with a one year old Charmander using Dragon Force, how would Garchomp fare if it was Charizard using Dragon Force? Such a frightening thought, that ability was comparable to Mega Evolution even, Better even since Charmander's power increased a little bit even after Dragon Force activated, it was such a hack's ability. All three, the two adults and the kid, agreed not to publish this discovery officially until he made an official debut in a league conference, it was only at that point would the grown ups be reassured that he was strong enough to defend himself from any thieves who wanted to steal a Pokemon with an unheard of ability. XXXXX flashback and XXXXX normally, children start training their Pokemon at the age of 10 when the law allowed them to start their official trainer careers, or 9 if they were lucky enough to get one beforehand, even then most trainers, even some of the elites, who only got that rank due to several years of experience, relied on battling against other trainers or wild Pokemon to make their Pokemon stronger. This method was extremely ineffective he reasoned, his mother loved both Pokemon contests and tournaments in which she would bring him to watch in real life, instead of on screen. He had watched people train in secret, often hiding in the bushes as they did so, and when he compared one who would battle others for training with ones who would do physical training exercises and sometimes resistance training, the one who had only battled against others lost early while the one who did resistance training became one of the top 16 participants. This result often repeated every year, it was a lucky thing that he could start training his Charmander, Torchic and Pikachu early due to the abundant amount of resources available to him, especially the vitamins, training equipment like weights and other nutrients. He was one of the few rare examples of future trainers that started training their Pokemon before the legal age, possibly the first to start training their Pokemon, at the age of 6. He had all the time in the world, he knew the correct routine to train Pokemon and he had so much resources accumulating that it was ridiculous. After all his mom was extremely rich, possibly the richest woman in the world because she owned the most popular Pokemon affiliated enterprise, the Pokemart, which was one of several leading projects run by Whirlpool corporations, the richest company in the world which coincidentally was also the leading producer in vitamins, the most important nutrient in real Pokemon training. The huge amounts of revenue that came in were due to the trainers who loved buying the high quality items that could only be found there, specifically the Pokeballs, potions of varying effect and technical machines that were only produced by Whirlpool Co. The first class VIP tickets she got us for this first class cruise was a tiny testament to her wealth, but despite her wealth, she was extremely humble. Though she could have brought the biggest mansion, she got us an average two-story house. Though she could have pampered him, she wanted him to live a normal life. Though she could have spoiled him silly and made him as bloody arrogant and naive as most rich kids, she wanted him to be as humble as any other normal kid, if not more. That was the main reason as to why he loved her, adored her, cherished her, because she was the best mom to have ever lived. Though he didn't like to rely on his family's wealth, obviously inheriting his humility and self-pride from his mother who worked from the ground up to get to where she was now, he would be a fool not to make use of the huge resources of vitamin, something not available to just any trainer obviously, which was at his beck and call courtesy of his mother. He and his mother were humble, not stupid, it's just they didn't like to blurt out the fact that they were possibly the wealthiest family to ever exist every chance they got, they preferred their secrecy thank you very much and that was why his mother went under the alias Whirlpool, hence the company name, 
after retiring from her relatively successful career in Pokemon battling, often ending up in the top 16, even in the top 8, and sometimes in the top 4 in lead competitions. Apparently his father and mother were intense rivals and married after revealing their feelings during a lead conference battle. He had definitely inherited both their skills, his Pokemon training skills from his father and his smarts from his mother. And it's probably the reason why his Charmander, Pikachu and Torchic were so strong after two years of constant training despite not having evolved. He would dare say that they were at low-tier elite level, enough to match the Pokemon from the top 16 competitors in the Kalos League if they weren't so lacking in real experience, from what he watched during the conference matches, Cannon Ash got his Squirtle and Bulbasaur to match the top 100 in his first rookie year while focusing on training other Pokemon, and quite frankly he was an idiot, so don't complain that they are off just yet. It helped that he only had three Pokemon at the time too so that his attention wasn't so divided. Unlike most trainers he preferred his Pokemon gaining physical stats and perfecting their skill sets through balancing between power and attack speed over wasting time gaining experience from battling other trainers when your Pokemon wasn't even strong enough to use that experience. He had them wear heavy weights totaling to half their weight as well as their maximum intake of vitamin in order to peak their physical performance in strength, speed and endurance and enhance their training experience. But let's forget all about that, until later, it was time to play with his buddies. He was so focused on reminiscing that he didn't notice the incoming dark clouds coming at all. XXXXX meanwhile in the skies XXXXX, kind of the same situation as in the Genesect movie, except for she isn't protected by Pokemon in this instance, I know most legendaries are meant to be genderless, even this one, but I am making the one from the first movie a male while the one from Genesect movie will be female. Pov she wasn't expecting this at all. She underestimated the power of this storm and it would prove to be her downfall. Her task was simple, gather enough food and other essential resources for her friends back home, back in New Island that was combined with Faraway Island. It had taken her longer than usual to gather enough food, and even now there was barely enough to last the week. She wanted to take a shortcut since she thought her friends must be been starving by now. But now, she would fail her mission, at full power, she could take care of this storm with ease, but the constant state of hunger weakened her powers, normally legendaries don't need food to sustain their powers, because the energies of the universe would sustain them as long as they retained Lord Arceus' blessing. Struck by lightning right after her psychic barrier broke, she fell, further down the abyss, unaware of what place she would enter. Forgive me my, friends, forgive me, Mew, I have failed you. XXXXX back at the first class cruise XXXXX, 10 minutes earlier. Sorry for the interruption but due to his unexpected storm we will be making a temporary stop at Cinnabar Island, until the storm subsides, make use of your time, explore the island, or stay on the ship. Five minutes later, Cinnabar Island. Hear that, dear? Why don't you go explore the island with your friends and take your bag with you? You never know when you might need to heal an injured Pokemon, you seem to have a knack for coming across the helpless. Yep sure mom, let's go guys, I hear there's a gym here. Yeah, let's go. They shouted in unison. XXXXX Cinnabar Island XXXXX. Five minutes later, same time as the lightning strike. Naruto, after seeing something that looked like a meteor, beckoned his Pokemon to follow him and trailed towards the location where the meteor seemed to impact. The closer he came, the wrenching feeling in his gut seemed to lessen, the smoke popping up due to the crash made it pretty hard to navigate his way to the crash site through sight alone, but the faint moans of pain allowed him to get there easier. Despite his poor skill in his new mental abilities, he could still detect large amounts of energy in the air, it made his skin tingle in excitement, what if it was a legendary? OMG the implications were massive. With newfound enthusiasm, he pushed himself through the remaining trees moving branches and bushes from his path before he found a clearing, with a huge crater in the middle. What he saw made his eyes widen beyond belief, it was a bipedal, humanoid creature with some feline features, it was primarily grey with a long, purple tail, on top of its head were two short, blunt horns, and it had purple eyes. A tube extended from the back of its skull to the top of its spine, bypassing its neck. It has a defined chest and shoulders, which resemble a breastplate, the three digits on each hand and foot have spherical tips, its tail is thick at the base, but thins before ending in a small bulb, it was indeed a Pokemon, but it was no Pokemon that Naruto had ever seen or read about in the libraries. It looks, like a Mew? If you looked you more closely, it did indeed resemble the Mew a lot, except it was grey and had a taller body with longer limbs. He could still, feel, the immense power reeking in the air, all positing toward the mysterious Pokemon, wait, it's injured, quite severely too. Meeting hurt Pokemon seemed to look like quite the trend for him nowadays, but nonetheless, he had to help the Pokemon quickly, 
the moans coming from the Pokemon was getting fainter. Hold on, it'll help you, I've got several hyper potions and a medkit here. He definitely needed to thank his mother again, after bringing back Pikachu, his mother had helped taught him the fine arts of Pokemon medicine, he was apprenticed to the local nurse Joy. Ah the wonders of being the son of the woman who owned nearly every Pokemon affiliated buildings, that just happened to include the Pokemon Center as well, a profit free project of his mother's in order to help trainers everywhere, he shuddered to think how trainers went by before Whirlpool Corporation was built. Who, are you? What, who was that? While he was trying to lessen the Pokemon's injury with his medical equipment, he had a voice from somewhere. Down here child, he looked down at the Pokemon, whose eyes were directed towards him with a knowing look in its eyes, sudden realization came towards him before he gawked. Wait, you can talk, yes, you took that much easier than I expected from what I have seen from the few humans I have talked to, I am not one to usually communicate with you people, ironic, to think that I am being helped by one right now. Save your energy, here, let me spray your wounds, whoa that's a big one right there, here, spraying a hyper potion, good looks a lot better. Huff, huff, my, the pain feels less, do, do you have any food? I can heal my wounds quicker, if I had enough energy, there was a lot of reluctance in the Pokemon's voice, but he ignored it in favor of getting the sandwiches in his backpack. He gave it to the Pokemon, it took a few seconds but it took it in the end. The hasty motions in which the Pokemon ate his food, despite its pain, betrayed its obvious hunger, he looked on in sadness, his mother hosted several communal food stands around the world in order to help any hungry wild Pokemon eat, but to see one now hurt his heart deeply. Deep in thought he hadn't noticed the Pokemon finish eating before his mind heard the Pokemon's soft feminine voice again. Thank you child, I see not every human is as despicable as I had been led to believe, my body is quickly regaining some of its former energy. He had ignored the jab at his race once he had seen the Pokemon's critical wounds heal so fast that he gawked, the faint green, blue energy that surrounded its body during the healing process also intrigued him, it wasn't like any of the other healing moves known to man and if it was a known move, he had never seen such instantaneous healing. That healing ability you just saw is one every legendary Pokemon is known to possess, as legendaries are not bound to the technical machines and moves that only normal Pokemon can do. Psychics, you couldn't hide anything from them, but holy hell. You mean the theory that legendaries are so powerful due to getting their powers from the unlimited energy source of the planet is true? Yes, but since I am not a true legendary, I have not been blessed by Lord Arceus, thus every time I gather energy from the planet, from mature, I lose a bit of my strength each time, but the food you gave me earlier gave me just enough power to use the nature's energies to heal my wounds. Is that right? Give me a second, he took out a small capsule that was labeled experimental capsule. He threw it a short distance away, please don't explode on me, please don't explode on me, please don't, woo hoo it worked. In mid air, the capsule automatically popped open as a red beam went out and formed into several food items, enough for a large picnic. There was even a complimentary red and white mat under all the food, it was an idea he had one day, a simple revelation frankly, so simple that he was shocked no one had even thought of it. If you could store Pokemon into a minuscule red and white ball, why the hell couldn't you do the same for normal items? Oh, he couldn't wait to get this secret project back to his mother. He looked back to the shocked Pokemon, here eat up as much as you want. Taking a while once again, the Pokemon nodded as he sat on the mat and ate some of the foods, starting with the still hot ramen. Amused by the look of awe on the Pokemon, he sat on the opposite side with his Pokemon as they ate together, there was an awkward silence for a while, but he got the courage to speak first. So, what did you mean when you said you weren't a, true legendary? I'd rather not say, if people found out about my true origins, they might feel encouraged to repeat their actions. Um, okay then, he had a pretty good hypothesis but he wouldn't invade the Pokemon's privacy, that being said, he was wondering why the Pokemon was eating at such a reserved pace when it was clearly hungry. You can call me, Mewtwo in case you are wondering what to call me, and I was planning to take all this food back to my friends, if you'll let me. Mewtwo? That pretty much confirmed his suspicions, looks like a Mew, his name sounds like a Mew, not even trio legendaries had names that similar, reluctant to share his identity and origins, humans were somehow involved and he wasn't a true legendary, yet a legendary nonetheless judging from its tone. You're a clone aren't you? The Pokemon nodded reluctantly, go figure. Of course there would be someone stupid out there in the real world to clone a freaking legendary, bloody idiots, yet he was kind of happy that Mewtwo would share at least that part with him despite their short meeting. It was the least I could do, you did save me despite having no obligations to do so, in this short time we've had together, you have proved that not every human base their actions on greed or the lust for power, thank you. Noted, 
It was obvious Mewtwo had grown a dislike for humans in general after finding out it was an experiment, and since no one had bothered to correct its stereotype, Mewtwo continued to hate humans, the mention of friends and bringing back food to them, and considering Mewtwo's earlier hunger, obvious conclusion, Mewtwo, like most legendaries, coined itself as a protector of Pokemon and was looking after a huge group of Pokemon that couldn't fend for themselves. You were indeed quite sharp, Naruto, you read my mind didn't you? I am sorry, I just wanted to learn your identity, but some memories popped up and I was curious, I find myself happy, that there is someone of such a pure heart in this world, has reignited my hope in the goodness of this world. Since Mewtwo had read his mind, he had automatically assumed that Mewtwo already knew about his parents as well as their wealthy status, so he thought there really was no point in beating around the bush, that and Mewtwo must be been referring to him saving two of the three Pokemon eating next to him, listening to their conversation with faint interest. You know all this food, if you'll allow me, I can bring a lot more supplies to you and your friends, I am sure they must be as hungry as you were, Mewtwo nodded faintly, finally, there was a small trace of hope for her friends, though they were naturally powerful due to the experiments, they were unfamiliar to the natural ways of the world and they wouldn't survive two weeks out in the real world, having someone influential in human society would help them tremendously. As if detecting the excitement in the legendary Pokemon, he brought out his phone and made a call. Mom, can you help me with something? I'll explain later, sending you my coordinates so you can see the situation for yourself. Yes, honey, what is it? Can you contact the Whirlpool Co? head of logistics and tell them to prepare a ship filled with cargo full of potions, food and medical supply. I have to stay here on Cinnabar Island too, help, with a slight problem. Problem? Oh no you don't. I am not leaving you here alone young man, whatever it is, I am coming with you to help. There really was no point in arguing, hell hath no fury like a protective mother, more so when their children are in some sort of problem, so he didn't complain about her need to stay here with him. Then, can you take our belongings with you and call a Professor Oak to wait a few days, maybe before we actually arrive at his lab? All right. He'll ask the questions when I see the problem, that's what he loved about his family, they never trouble each other with pointless questions unless it was entirely appropriate. XXXXX 30 minutes later at the coast of the island XXXXX. Naruto, what did I tell you about meeting Pokemon in dire need of help? It's not my fault I inherited my love of Pokemon from you. Still I am so proud of you my boy, to meet your first legendary at the age of 8. Your father didn't until he was 13 right before he won the Indigo Conference, they're like good luck charms. She had arrived 15 minutes earlier, it took a while, but he and Mewtwo had finally told her of Mewtwo's situation, seeing her love for Pokemon, she agreed to his plan to help Mewtwo's friends almost instantly. Oh, I can see the ship from here, so Mewtwo, was it? Are you sure you can teleport all the supplies to this, island? She was still skeptical but if it had the magical properties that Mewtwo had explained, such as a magical cloak that hid the residence of a legendary then that explained one of the reasons as to why legendaries were so hard to find. Positive, I must thank you people again, you have my eternal gratitude, however, please do not tell anyone of what you have seen during your stay on New Island. You have our word, Mewtwo, it's so exciting, he really was excited to meet these new Pokemon. Apparently, along with the other experiment Pokemon, he had saved helpless Pokemon from around the globe, so there was bound to be Pokemon from nearly every region, and brought them to the island. Another magical property of the island was that it was suited to fit the user's needs, but there was so many Pokemon, that the island's ability to magically produce huge amounts of fruits in hours was outweighed by the number of Pokemon there. Okay. The ships arrived Mewtwo. I've sent the workers back onto the cruise ship we came in so there won't be anybody to identify you. His mother had come back shortly after going to check on her workers, it was amazing how fast she got things done. Now. Work your magic, Mewtwo, XXXXX New Island combined with Faraway Island XXXXX. Holy crap. That was quick. Indeed Mewtwo really did work her magic, this was the first time he had ever been teleported and boy did it make him dizzy for a while, his mother was a tad bit more dignified, but she was a bit dazed too. After regaining their composure, they looked up to see themselves on a beach surrounded by dozens of Pokemon, some familiar and most unfamiliar, with the cargo ship right behind them. There was so much different emotions he could feel, curiosity, fear, surprise and most of all, happiness directed towards Mewtwo. My friends, I have finally returned, Pokemon gathered around the legendary, some of them he recognized as Kanto Pokemon such as, Venusaur, Blastoise and holy crap, they're the final forms of the Kanto starters and, oh, my, god right in front of him was a Charizard, the final form of the Charmander family such as the one right next to him. The Charizard and his Charmander faced off, both inspecting each other with a look of curiosity. 
There was an awkward silence between before Charizard took a step forward. Unexpectedly, Charizard bobbed its head down and nuzzled its face against Charmander's while earning a cute out of character Char from the smaller fire Pokemon. While watching the spectacle, he didn't realize a group of Pokemon were right beside him watching him and his mother with pure curiosity. Um, Mewtwo, why are the Pokemon looking at me like that? Because for most of them, it has been a long time since they've seen a human and for a specific few this is the first time they've seen humans at all, some are worried you were here to hurt them until I reassured them otherwise. Is that right? Well, don't worry guys, I won't harm you, he approached a smaller Vulpix and patted it on the head and rubbed its chin earning a cute moan from the red vixen. Aw aren't you just the cutie, the Vulpix yipped at his compliment and rested its head on his lower hand. The other Pokemon looked at this display with a smile as they further approached the strange being known as a human and broke the silence that was present ever since his arrival. Although they are still wary of you, they are gradually coming to trust you Naruto, all you have to do is wait and they will open up to you in time. You guys must be hungry, wait here, he ran over to the ship and opened the entrance to the cargo bay revealing hundreds of large open crates containing Pokemon supplies. The Pokemon gawked in the heavenly display before them, when the human came they had temporarily forgot about their state of hunger, but now, looking at this much food, their hunger came back full blast, some of them drooled even. In a few moments, dozens of Pokemon rushed towards the cargo bay as they greedily ate from the first dozen crates, there were hundreds of crates, possibly a thousand crates so he wasn't worried that the food would run out by the end of this week and besides, knowing his mum she would call another shipment on a heartbeat and he knew why. The look of sheer happiness on their faces as they ate was reward enough, even the few Pokemon that were still wary, after being reassured by Mewtwo, looked happy after they joined in the festivities. To bring happiness to Pokemon like this, it brought a smile to his face as well as his mother's. Thank you Naruto, thank you Kashina Uzumaki, thank you so much for bringing smiles to their faces for the first time in years. Hey no problem, come, while the Pokemon are enjoying themselves, I want to show you something, you have earned my trust, as well as my gratitude. Where are you taking us? His mother asked, to the place that will explain the reasons as to why this island is magically enchanted. A few years ago, a special Pokemon came and gave life to this island, that is why this island was able to grow berries and fruits in the matter of hours, she is in all technicalities, my older sister. They were shocked at this, this could only mean. I see you have realized, yes, she is one of the oldest legendaries in the living embodiment, the will of Lord Arceus and thus the creator has seen fit to give her the genes of every one of his creations, yes, she is known to you humans, as Mew, the new species Pokemon. OMG, screw it, he may have missed his old home, but this trip was so worth it, meeting two, two, legendaries in a single day was practically unheard of, not to mention in a few minutes there would be two in the same place. Mom, I know honey, I am speechless too, this is one of the eventful days of my life, meeting two legendaries at the same time. Oh there are more than just two legendaries, myself included, on this island, there are three others that were originally native to Sinnoh, they are the guardians of Mew's resting place as well as the peacekeepers of this island, you will be meeting them shortly after I remove the enchantment. Enchantment? What enchantment? Look on and be amazed. Lifting its hand, Mewtwo released obscene amounts of energy, and in front of them the air seemed to distort until. WHHOOM a huge tree of crystal, several times bigger than even Groudon popped up in the center of the island. How, how, what is that? How can even you hide something that big without it being detected by some random flying Pokemon passing by? That is the tree of beginning, while technically this island is meant to be located between the Orange Islands and the Kanto region. Mew is so powerful in her psychic gifts that she was able to place a permanent enchantment on the island that sealed this place off from the outside world in a different dimension if you will. Those who come near this place in the real world, will only see an empty sea of water and pass through unhindered when in actuality they pass through a disturbance, rift in space that will teleport them to the other side of this island forwards. Mew is that powerful? His respect for legendaries grew to a whole another level, he had thought only Palkia, the master of space, and Arceus were the only ones capable of creating another dimension of space. Of course, she is after all one of the most oldest legendaries and hence one of the most powerful despite her childlike nature showing otherwise, but in honest truth it was not entirely her powers that sealed this place off. What do you mean by that? The tree of beginning aided in her attempt, the crystals on this rock absorb the sun's limitless energy and transfers it to the soil of this island, that in being one of the first creations of Lord Arceus has given it so much life force that it exceeds even the planet, thus it has given the Pokemon of this island, especially psychic Pokemon like Mew and myself a major power boost, but once we step off the island our powers will reduce drastically. 
But due to the hyper-energized soil, the berries and fruits that grow off it give the Pokemon so much energy that their bodies grow immensely stronger, faster and sturdier just by eating it, it functions similar to vitamins, except the effects are immediate and are three times more effective in a Pokemon's muscle development. But enough talk we have reached the entrance to the insides of the Tree of Beginning, so are you ready to meet four more legendaries? Yep, definitely, good, because they're right on cue. Right on cue just like Mewtwo said, a huge series of stomps could be heard past the entrance, he could make three golem-like figures, wait, he recalled keywords Mewtwo had telepathically said during their conversation. Three others, legendary, golem-like figures. He knew of only one trio of legendary Pokemon that looked like golems, but weren't they originally from Hoenn? Strange. Yes, you are indeed correct in your assumption, except they were originally created by another golem legendary, one far more powerful than even this legendary trio combined, in Sinnoh before it was sealed off by the people that worshipped it for being far too powerful. Allow me to introduce to you, the three guardians of the Tree of Beginning. Pyramid King Brandon will not have these Pokemon. Regirock. A large golem made of brown and orange rocks appeared, it had an orange seven dot pattern on its face that resembled a H, it had long arms with jutted shoulders and a flat surface at the end of its arms, this Pokemon was the rock type legendary, Regirock. Regice. The second golem was completely composed of ice that was as dazzling as crystals, it also had a seven dot pattern on its face except it resembled a plus, it had four spikes on its backs, its legs were conical and unlike Regirock, it had three spikes on each of its arms, this Pokemon was the legendary ice type Pokemon, Regice. Registeel. The last golem had a top half body that was spherical and black, dark gray with gray armor over its normal body covering everything except the center of its body and its arms. Mewtwo, it is good to see you have returned, Lady Mew is still sleeping, Regirock was the first to speak. That is all right, I am sure she will be in a happy mood once she's seen, the one, especially after what he's done for the Pokemon here. There was a brief silence until a barren voice came from Registeel. Yes, I've witnessed the Pokemon refill themselves happily, never before have I seen such looks on their face, once I saw their cheerful visage and now that I can sense the purity of your heart, I am convinced, it truly is an honor to meet you, my lord. My lord. My lord. All three legendary Pokemon bowed, but not towards Mewtwo, they bowed towards him much to his shock. Come, we will escort you to Lady Mew, very well, come Naruto, Miss Kashina, it is time you came face to face with my sister. The moment they had all been waiting for was fast coming, to meet the legendary Mew would be the sight for the ages, not even Professor Oak, arguably the most knowledgeable about Mew, although the information he provided wasn't much, had probably never spoken to the legendary. After a few minutes of walking across magnificent crystalline structures they had entered a large room that finally had some green life but was still mostly covered by large crystals. A. N. Maybe additional details that were not actually in the movie like below. In the center, was a large blue crystalline tree that had a hollow in the middle, he could hear faint sounds of coos from inside, it sounded so cute, childlike and melodic. Mewtwo it is good to see you again, likewise, Lucario. Out of nowhere. A large blue and black cannon-like Pokemon had fallen from above and onto the small patch of grass in front of them. Who? Regirock saw fit to interrupt in order to answer the obvious question lying on his tongue. This, my lord, is a famous Pokemon named Lucario, his species is originally native to Sinnoh, but he is no doubt one of the most powerful Lucarios to have ever lived, you would know him, as the Lucario that faithfully served alongside Sir Aaron, a famous Aura Guardian, now he serves as the fourth guardian of the Tree of Beginnings, in honor of his late master's sacrifice to save the tree. His aura, it shines so much brighter than Sir Aaron's, Lucario thought while eyeing Naruto with a reminiscent expression. Mew, everyone looked at the crystal tree as an adorable sound echoed from the hollow of the tree. Mew, Lady Mew has awoken. Every telepathic Pokemon cried out in unison. Finally, after years of searching for this mysterious Pokemon, he and his mother would be the first to ever meet Mew for more than five seconds. Mew. A tiny paw clenched onto the bottom edge of the hollow as a pink bipedal Pokemon slowly crept out with its left hand softly rubbing its right eye with the right hand while partially blocking the left side of its mouth with its right hand in order to reduce the volume of the yawning sound it made. The pink legendary Pokemon wasn't as majestic as Mewtwo, but it was so, so, so freaking adorable. The mother and son pair thought at the same time. After it stopped rubbing its eyes, clearly recovered from its drowsy state, Mew looked upon the patiently waiting group before it with a curious yet playful look in its eyes, that is until it laid its eye on him where the playful gleam in its eye, morphed into, affection and longing. Mew, 
The tiny pink a legendary floated across the crystal chamber slowly making its way towards him. As it floated right before his face it slowly brought out its hands. To his surprise, Mew cupped his cheeks with its tiny and soft paws, while looking at him with tears in its eyes, why was it crying? Lady Mew, the golems behind him called out softly with tenderness as they continued. This proves it, he is the one. Mew, Mew, Mew. It cooed affectionately as it rubbed its cheeks against his brought out hands, once it finished, it circled excitedly around him crying out its name repeatedly until it landed onto his left shoulder and rubbed cheeks once again, it really did love rubbing cheeks. Yes Lady Mew, after so many years of waiting, Lord Arsu's first and most important prophecy has come true. What prophecy? Can someone please tell me what's happening here? He really had no idea what was happening here, meeting all these legendaries in the same day was overloading his brain with excitement, awe and shock, all he knew was it somehow concerned him. Mew, yes it is indeed time, Regis finally spoke for the first time since their meeting, looking towards the knowing Mewtwo, he continued. Mewtwo. I know you did not come into this world through natural means, but will you also join hands with the one to fulfill the prophecy? Yes, he has earned my trust, I will join him if he allows it. Lucario, I will, he has the same aura as my former master, I look forward to see how the world of man and Pokemon alike will change under his presence. Mew, 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 Mew cried out in happiness and excitement. Um guys, what are you talking about? Mewtwo. Lucario and the other legendaries looked over towards him with an expectant look. On behalf of Mew and everyone else here, Naruto Uzumaki, will you do us an honor, and catch every Pokemon on this island alongside us legendaries, watch over us as you become the greatest Pokemon trainer the world has ever seen. That's it this last bit of information was the last straw. One human, especially an eight-year-old child could handle only so much information. So he did the only logical thing to do once he had experienced a mind gasm. He fainted, game reference irony intended. Sitting near the edge of a cliff, snow, white, cold snow was all he could see, within a 100 meters radius the only thing within sight was rocks blanketed in snow, snow that constantly brushed up against his skin, but he ignored it, for four straight years he was training on the peak of the mountain and within time, he and his Pokemon had adapted to the cold, harsh environment. The only human life form currently on the mountain was a 10-year-old boy, wearing only an open black and orange jacket on top of nothing but bare skin alongside dark blue trousers, one had to wonder how he wasn't encased in ice already but that was trivial at the moment, but he was Naruto and no amount of snow could freeze him. Pika, twisting his head behind him, he took a few moments to stare back at one of his most important partners. Pikachu, the little electric mouse Pokemon had decided to brave through the many hardships of the mountains on the island without complaint, all because he had wanted to be strong for his trainer. Pikachu had been technically the first Pokemon he had captured in the wilds, after rescuing him from a life and death situation from a flock of mad Spearows, Pikachu was immensely indebted to him. A close bond had formed between them almost instantly and he had become one of his most important companions. Speaking of his three favorite Pokemon, he had looked over the mouse towards the huge flame Pokemon, the Draconic, bipedal Pokemon was diligently training his muscular arms by lifting two gigantic blocks of pure steel simultaneously. Years of training and battling with his other Pokemon, several legendary Pokemon amongst them, had helped him become vastly stronger compared to most Charizard. Now, the Charizard before him had more muscular arms, stronger legs and a wider wingspan, he was now immensely stronger, faster and hardened. But even four or so years of constant training, with some rests at the side, did not change his personality, no, rather it just strengthened them, Charizard loved fighting, but despite what many consider being a strange hobby, he was his most stalwart ally, Pikachu just right behind in second place, after all, Charizard was his first Pokemon, though extremely prideful, he was loyal and cared a lot for his fellow friends, and unlike most prideful Pokemon he wasn't afraid to show it, he would even take time off training, to give some tips to the other Pokemon. Training using a similar but lighter regime to Charizard was Tyranitar, the armor Pokemon was training just below him on a large road, he had let the Pokemon take free reign on his own training as long as he had diminished his capabilities by wearing heavy weights on his wrists and legs, before Pikachu had gained his attention, he was watching him and Dragonite spar and then go on to spar with the other resident Pokemon on this island. It's been two years since that eventful day, he had acquiesced to the shocking request of the legendary Pokemon, even now he still couldn't believe how lucky he was. With the dozens of Pokemon he had made close friends with over the two-year interval and his first male friend, he was pretty secluded in Kanto, the island Pokemon were mostly his friends during childhood, waiting at the Indigo Plateau, Brock, 
just waiting to support him in the Indigo Conference he just knew he would get far in the competition, yes, after two years he had started his adventure. Boy, was it awesome. New Pokemon, new people, new sights, new battles, he would cherish the memories he made this year forever. It felt like yesterday he thought. When the Pokemon that were initially wary became his best friends, for the two years before he became a rookie trainer, he had shed blood and sweat alongside his Pokemon as they trained to become the strongest they could be, Mewtwo was right when he mentioned that the island could change habitats on parts of the island in order to suit the needs of its master, namely him, Mewtwo and Mew, hence the creation of the mountain he was sitting on. Professor Oak blew a gasket when he had heard of the rare Pokemon he had caught on the island. For days the scientist would relentlessly ask him on whether or not he could visit this island. There was a thundercloud, somehow, over his head when he heard he couldn't do to not being blessed by either Mewtwo or Mew. But he had got over it pretty quickly especially after he had allowed the man, with his Pokemon's consent of course, to research some of the rarer Pokemon on the island via PC transfers between the one on the island and Oak's laboratory, it was amusing to watch Oak's hysterical look when the man saw his pseudo-legendaries and legendaries, although they weren't so enthusiastic and had kept some distance from the strange man for some time until they learned to trust him. Don't make any mistakes. Professor Oak was a swell dude once you get to know him, he was kind of like the grandfather he never had, a position that old Mangurkin used to fill, it's just that the man had a pretty weird look on his face once he saw something he liked, the weirdest look was when Oak saw Mew and Mewtwo. You could literally see stars in the Mont's eyes, the man had obtained a lot of information on his legendaries and he was giddy ever since, not to mention he needed Oak to register Mewtwo as an official Pokemon so that it could participate in the conferences, such as the Indigo Conference that would commence in a few hours. The Pokemon had allowed him to set up a technical base of operations over a destroyed landsite on the island that originally belonged to Team Rocket, a group he had found out were the cause for the creation for all the cloned Pokemon including Mewtwo, he had destroyed all their bases of operation that he could find on Kanto this year. It made monitoring the activities of his Pokemon that much easier. He had wanted to move from his position but he didn't want to disturb his third favorite Pokemon, Espeon, who was now sleeping on his lap comfortably. Pikachu understood and crept up to hop on his trainer's left shoulder nuzzling his cheek on his trainer's cooing happily. Pika. Chu. Smiling happily, he flashed both Espeon and Pikachu a heartwarming smile and cupped Pikachu's other cheek with his soft hand earning another coo from his Pokemon. What is it Pikachu? Pika Pika Pi. It's time to go. He looked up at the clock. Oh, so it is. Pika. Um let's wait a while. We still have time to spare. Pikachu nodded. Pika Pi. Gently carrying Espeon up, he used one of his aura skills to keep her asleep, Pikachu got off his shoulder and started following him towards the fire, placing her down next to the fire, she moved a bit as she left the warmth of her trainer, sliding his hand against her fur once again, he left towards the others. He wondered what the others were up to now. XXXXX meanwhile XXXXX. Hey Charizard, you pumped up for the conference. Blaziken asked. Just finished battling with Blastoise evening the playing field with his speed and skill. Charizard grinned. Of course, this is the chance to prove who's the most badass Charizard in the entire world. Thought so. Anyway, do you want to spar Charizard? We haven't had a good fight since yesterday. One would think that wasn't a long time, but these Pokemon really, really like to fight. Sure. Just gather up Garados and Salamence then we'll do a 2v2 battle. All right then. Give me a second to wake them up. As Blaziken walked away, Pikachu approached in a rather cautious mood. Charizard you have to help me. What? What's wrong buddy? It's Espeon. Those brief, precise words explained it all to the big lizard as he chuckled at the electric mouse's predicament, but he still decided to play dumb anyway. Yeah what about Espeon? Oh come on, you gotta help me ever since we started a relationship. Espeon's been hunting me like crazy so she can bring me to some dark, deserted spot and have her way with me. For the love of Arceus, Charizard you gotta help me. Ha 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 ho this is hilarious, little Pikachu is afraid of some cat, then again you are a mouse but who cares, when it comes to relationships, you gotta prove to the female that you're the dominant one, that she should obey the alpha male, go right up to her, look her in the face and show her who's boss, Charizard proudly yelled. Says the one who gets whipped by Charlotte every time you make her angry. How about when we get back home I tell her that you didn't help a friend in need, a friend who's about to face the greatest peril of his life. Hey, now let's not go there. You see, when I am in a relationship I am not afraid to confront the female and tell her what's what straight in the face, you see what I am getting at. Still doesn't change the fact that you're gonna get whipped. Shivering at the thought of the female Charizard getting pissed, he did a 180, 
Sai, not even the strongest of Pokemon could hope to stand against their female counterparts, even when said Pokemon can travel faster than the speed of sound. Good point. Now are you gonna help me? Or do I have to resort to her? All right, man, all right ill help. Hide in the bushes over there. Espeon is on the other side. Okay. Thanks man you're a real pal. Flashing a brilliant, fake smile he waved Pikachu goodbye. As he walked away, he looked over towards Espeon. What Pikachu didn't know was that Espeon was also heading towards the bush he pointed at, but Pikachu didn't need to know that. He asked for my help, but he never said I couldn't help Espeon as well. Laughing like mad, he went back to his training. Another mountain nearby. Come on, Tyranitar this is crazy. Oh don't worry, it'll be fine Dragonite. You think, it's perfectly safe. Uh huh next you're going to be saying that a Bulbasaur jumping into a hot, blazing pit of lava is safe. Ah ha 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 don't worry this is just an avalanche what's the worst that could happen. Okay I know that Charizard did this several times in his training, but you're not Charizard, you're his apprentice and I am worried you won't be able to survive. Don't worry, do you think he'll kick the bucket when I have you by my side? Blushing, the female Dragonite could only stay silent. Alright now stay back and let the magic happen. Okay but be safe, I fear that your training under Charizard has made you adopt his mentality. Hey. Charizard is awesome. Yeah, yeah whatever. Flying off, she watched Tyranitar in the distance as he used Earthquake. Smiling gleefully at the sudden stampede of falling snow and rocks, he opened up his arms, pulled out his chest, raised his head and yelled. Come at me bro. XXXXXXXXXXX. I had the feeling some of my Pokemon were doing something incredibly stupid yet so badass at the same time, then again, greatness and insanity comes hand in hand. But his Pokemon, especially Charizard and Pikachu, they were something special, he knew they would be, he couldn't wait to show them off at the Indigo Conference. Now, for the first time since their birth, these Pokemon would become famous. There were several Pokemon here that were abandoned by their former trainers. Unappreciated by them no matter how hard they worked, but no longer, for two years, they had worked so hard to get to this point, for two years in the continuous, encouraging spur coming from him they had trained for this moment for the moment when millions upon millions of people would watch his Pokemon with awe, with respect, with appreciation, something they, sadly enough, had never experienced from Pokemon fans other than himself, his mother and Professor Oak. Even now, just hours until the cameras would watch his Pokemon begin their first steps in dominating, he hoped, the competition, they were still training with vigor, the excitement, the anticipation visible upon their visages as they tried to tone it down with equally vigorous training. That was something he and his Pokemon shared, godlike amounts of enthusiasm, energy and the love for battling, a deadly combination to be sure, with the exception of his caretaker Pokemon ranging from Chanseys and 30 or so Kangaskhans that only loved him, their babies and the infant Pokemon of their friends, namely all of his Pokemon. It was time, he just had to make sure of one thing before he went. Moving over to his huge plasma screen TV, he opened the electronic portable device and switched to one of the news channels, Oak had called Charles Goodshow in order to officialize the existence of a certain legendary in his possession, he had to make sure one of the news channels had actually informed the world of it before he could actually register for the conference. This is reporter Michelle Cumming live to you to shed insight on how recently Pokemon researcher, Professor Oak has made an astounding discovery, it is widely known that Professor Oak is largely known for being the first to make small observations of a legendary Pokemon called Mew, but not two days ago, we have received official confirmation from the Pokemon League that Oak has made breakthrough discoveries on the elusive Mew. Though the famous researcher has been keeping a tight lid on his sources, Charles Goodshow, president of the World Pokemon League, has personally supported the Professor Oak's findings, not only that, but it has been finally confirmed that Professor Oak has also discovered a new species of Pokemon that is rumored, believe or not, to be another legendary native to Kanto. As you can see behind me, a group of researchers and Pokemon enthusiasts from around the world who have come to spectate the Indigo Conference have also assembled in front of Professor's Oak Laboratory in order to find more about this mysterious legendary. Oh, Professor Oak has finally come out and has started talking, let's go and find out what he is saying. Professor Oak, can you provide any further insight on this new legendary you have discovered? Haha <laughs> I am sorry, but I cannot release much information out to the public, but quite recently I did meet one of the legendaries again. They like to roam around the vicinity back in the small mountains nearby sometimes. That was absolute bullshit that he, Oak and Goodshow concocted in order to distract the public from finding out the truth until they actually made a debut. It seemed to work too, 
Only a moment sooner after the man said that did the entire audience run off towards the nearby mountains even the reporter ran off with the crowd. He would make sure to thank the professor later when they would meet at the conference, his mom and the professor wanted to watch his first conference battles up close. He turned the TV off and walked slowly towards his sleeping Pokemon, it was time to go. He had trained alongside his Pokemon during their two-year training, he was never one to sit lazily on his butt anyway, and once he had captured the two fighting Pokemon, he trained in self-defense alongside Lucario, Hitmonlee and Primipoom had extensively taught him about several forms of martial arts, brute force attacks and aura techniques. The severe reigning regimes that included stuff only suitable for Pokemon, not humans, such as gearless mountain hiking, small boulder carrying runs and other severe sorts of muscle resistance training had made him a lot taller than normal 10-year-olds, bordering the average height of 14-year-olds and a physique that was pretty much unheard of from someone who hadn't even started puberty yet. He had nearly died a lot of times and he would have if it wasn't for his Pokemon, especially Mewtwo and Mew with their psychic abilities, saving his ass, the closest he came to dying ironically was when he was forced to tell his mom of what he was doing in the island, he had never come as close to dying, he even pissed his pants, when his, no word could describe her state, mother had punished him. Regardless, he was ready, ready to participate in a tournament where 256 of the best trainers in the region and then some would come together and battle it out for glory. Fame and excitement, but Pokemon were his life now, and he would prove to the world that the bond between him and his Pokemon was the greatest, he would prove to the world that he was the best of the best and he would make the ones who had abandoned his friends regret their decisions in the face of their skill, power, passion and determination. It was time to dazzle the world. XXXXX Indigo Plateau XXXXX Brock POV It has been a month since he last saw his traveling companion friend, he had joined Naruto after the younger boy had soundly beat him in the pewter gym without losing a single Pokemon at that in a 6 on 6 battle, instead of doing the traditional 3 on 3 battle. Battling wasn't really his passion anyway, he had really loved Pokemon breeding and had wanted to leave the gym for quite some time, thank god, his parents had come back which allowed him to travel again. He had wanted to travel with Naruto who accepted, and after seeing how well he treated his Pokemon and the unique Pokemon caretaking techniques he had witnessed from the rookie trainer, he knew he had made the right choice in a traveling companion. They had traveled together and went through thick and thin to get to where they were now, he had watched as his best friend, being a gym is pretty time consuming, went through the gyms like clockwork, without losing a single Pokemon in 6 on 6 battles. Sure in terms of gym battling there were some trainers who had boasted a more impressive record such as beating gyms with only one or two Pokemon in 6 on 6 battles, but Naruto was the sort of person who wanted to have all his Pokemon become experienced in battles rather than letting their most powerful do all the work. After Naruto had got all 8 badges, there was a month before the Indigo conference actually started and so Naruto decided to train in secret, he didn't really complain, they both like to keep secrets now and then, Having legendaries wasn't one of those secrets, much to his shock, because it was practically unheard of to have captured a legendary, much less five. Oh this year's spectators were going to be in one heck of a surprise. They were distracted a lot in terms of training during their journeys between cities and gyms. They had rescued endangered Pokemon in a heartbeat despite the life and death risks, made more friends in unique people from around the region and dismantled dozens of bases belonging to an infamous crime syndicate all around Kanto in less than a year so it was understandable that Naruto couldn't train his Pokemon very much, yet it was incredible that the extremely occupied boy had time to train the wild Pokemon he had caught this year. He had seen what Naruto could do to ship shape his rookie Pokemon into powerful Pokemon that could easily beat the gyms, in only two days time, now, with one month of pure, intense training he was extremely excited to see what his rookie Pokemon could do now. He had even shuddered to think what his first Pokemon could do now, the dozens he somehow obtained before he got his trainer license, he had seen some of them, Pikachu for starters and that 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 beast of a Pokemon called Charizard. He had never seen the true capabilities of Pikachu but he had enough common sense to know that the Charizard Ash had obtained was a one of a kind first class Charizard. The muscles on its arms, that were so distinguishable to an extent he had never seen in even Lance's Charizard, the officially strongest of its kind, on TV, and its greater than normal height made it seem, overbearing, even 10 meters away from when Charizard was called out, he could still feel the heat of the flames coming out of its nose. Naruto's Blaziken was pretty strong too, but he just knew from first glance that it couldn't compare to the Charizard. Just a few more hours and then he would witness the full fruits of Naruto's training, he was currently waiting near the registration office for the Indigo League, there were only a few more minutes until registration closed, he was starting to get worried. Just where is Naruto? 
His tone was laced with anxiety. It was only a minute later that the familiar muscular boy, with an open black orange jacket and headband, walked in through the electronic doors. It was kind of ironic, though Naruto's clothes were really simple, seeing that no one else chose to wear anything of the like and the toned abs that were highly visible due to the unzipped clothing made him really distinguishable. Moments later after leaving a blushing female clerk, much to his jealousy, he had finally approached the boy who looked glad to see him. Hey Brock, man, it's been a while, good to see you. It's good to see you too, Naruto, how was your training? That question was eating at him for the last month, who knows how strong his Pokemon were now. Fruitful, extremely fruitful, most of the Pokemon I've caught this year, that are competing, have decided to evolve to their final forms, he answered, but after a few seconds between them he spoke again with a knowing look he'll even be using my original Pokemon, including them five during the last four battles. Whoa, damn I can't wait, you're that confident you can last that long in the league. You're facing some of the toughest trainers out there, he was pretty confident Naruto could make it to at least the top eight with little difficulty, but there was no harm in asking, Naruto tended to use his all of his Pokemon while saving his strongest for last. That could be a fatal weakness in this league, no matter how strong his weakest were. Let's go up to the stadium, he spoke again want to take the train or just walk there. The train preferably, I've become kind of tired during this last month, of nothing but training, it should be relaxing to take in the luxuries of civilization once again. Got it, let's go. With that, they both exited the building and made their way towards the station. XXXXX normal pov XXXXX. They were making pretty fast progress until they saw two people, one they recognized as Officer Jenny Much to Brock's eye candy. They were bickering about something, it was pretty incoherent from where they were standing and his natural habit to help people in need, people bickering was apparently the universal sign for problem during his journey kicked in. He approached the contrasting pair but they had yet to notice him. Um, excuse me, is there a problem? They turned around immediately, Officer Jenny scanned his figure with a contemplative look. We're in need of a torch runner, the old man responded with the same look in his eye the one that was originally intended to bear the torch was injured and all our substitutes won't even make it for the opening ceremony. I can do the run. How about it? The prospect sounded so exciting and it would be a good way to spend the next three hours or so, waiting patiently right before an important match was never his forte, he was the type of guy who liked to be active 24-7. Are you sure? You may have an impressive physique but it's a big responsibility. No problems, I can finish the task easily, the female officer still looked a bit skeptical. Until the old man decided to add in his own two cents. Why not? Give the torch to the young man, what was your name again? Naruto. Naruto Namikaze Uzumaki, Mr. Goodshow. Namikaze Uzumaki. Oh ho, the son of the former champion Redder as his close friends know him as, Minato Namikaze, this was one of the three most promising participants, the ones that would most likely land in the top eight at least, that he was watching out for. The other two, the ones other than Naruto, had already won league championship titles in their own respective regions and then some in other regions, but this boy before him, he was different, apart from obtaining a legendary, a legendary for Pete's sake. He had this, aura about him. He couldn't really put it into words, but he was familiar with the presence of many champions in his lifetime and this boy before him, despite his rookie status, held that very same presence. Even without the assistance of those two legendaries Samuel had told him about, he knew this boy would make it far. This year's conference was one to remember for the history books. Then he'll look forward to see how you'll perform in this year's conference. Thank you. Now can I have that torch, time's a-wasting. He said eagerly. Ha ha. Sure my boy. Just hang around for a bit until Jenny fetches the torch. It took only a couple of seconds but finally they were on the way to the stadium with Goodshow and Brock in Goodshow's truck and Officer Jenny on her motorbike. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
to unite all people within our nation. Too ah. Damn he had called out his Dragonite too slow, he was forced to listen to more than half their motto before his Pokemon could. We're blasting off again. Yeah, that. He had walked over to the hole with his torch still in hand while Pikachu and Dragonite ran down to the trapped people and carried them up with vehicles in two that were somewhat damaged due to the collision of vehicles on top of one another after the fall. Are you alright guys? Yeah I am fine but good show. We think he's sprained his leg, Brock said. I am alright lad. Just give me a time to get a quick breather and we can be on our way, Goodshow said, but the bravado was clearly evident in the forced manner in which the old man spoke, seriously why can't an old man just admit he wasn't as tough as he was in his youth and get it done with already? That is nonsense. Use my Dragonite and go on ahead. Don't worry my Dragonite is big enough to hold four passengers, you'll be there in no time, I think we've had enough idiotic delays for this year's torch run, right? The smile on his face told everyone present that there was no room for discussion and quite frankly everyone agreed, they would make do without any more delays, Goodshow was looking at his Dragonite as if he was grading papers, he was probably trying to sum up the capabilities of his Pokemon. Very well lad, but you should still let Officer Jenny escort you once her bike's in order. Okay. Hopping on top of the semi-bowing Dragonite along with Brock, they waved goodbye as Dragonite flew off at a somewhat slow pace as to not shock its two passengers. He turned back to the female officer who was on her knees, completely focused on scanning her bikes for any substantial damage. Well Office Jenny is your bike still functional? Yeah, it'll last the entire journey, let's go. She hopped onto her back and beckoned him to continue. Not one to make a lady wait, he turned around and started sprinting full pace now, time was running out and he no longer had the luxury of jogging at a leisurely pace. XXXXX Pokemon Stadium XXXXX Opening parenthesis question mark. POV. There was a certain sense of excitement circling around the stadium, this feeling that you experience, knowing that the greatest battles of your life will happen in only a few more hours, the ones that will increase your fame and prestige, makes you a bit feral. It was the same for all the other opening ceremonies she was required to attend. Increasingly so this year, because this time Goodshow and the Torchbearer were delayed, it was tradition for Goodshow to follow the Torch Runner throughout half his or her run and then speed on ahead in order to get to the Pokemon Stadium first. Except this time, the one officer Jenny assigned to the protection of Goodshow had called in to inform that some thieves had tried to steal the torch presumably, Goodshow was just injured in the process. Everyone who had heard went frantic until Officer Jenny had reassured the crowd that the Torch Runner and Goodshow were still very much on their way. Then there was the first horn of the watchman to indicate that the league president had arrived, there was another one for the torch runner, sure, but what was strange is that there was no sound of any vehicles approaching, no honk of a truck, Goodshow's preferred transport, to indicate that the president had arrived. Instead a soft roar could be heard from above. Everyone looked up as a dragon-like figure was heading towards the stadium with two people on board. President Goodshow has arrived, the commentator cried out. And indeed if one was to look closer, the small figure of Goodshow could be made out barely. All the reporters flocked to the area that the newly arrived Dragonite and its two passengers had landed on, the second person was somewhat ignored by the majority of the crowd, she however recognized him as Brock, the former substitute gym leader of Pewter City. But what was he doing with Goodshow? And on a Dragonite for that matter? President Goodshow, we have heard that some troubles were experienced during the torch run. May we ask for the specifics of the events? One of the many reporters said. Well, some robbers decided the torch run would be a convenient way to steal the flames of Moltres, we fell into a trap set up by the thieves except the torch runner. As you can see, this dragonite behind me belongs to the torchbearer and together they had rescued us from the trap and dealt with the thieves immediately. With the president pointing towards the looming pseudo-legendary, the crowd had taken the time to inspect the Pokemon close up. Even from here, she could that this dragon was an impressive specimen of its rare species, compared to Drake's Dragonite, it was taller by one and a half feet, its muscles were more defined in its wingspan, its species having wingspans that were known to be unconventionally small for dragon Pokemon, were a bit bigger than even Lance's Dragonite. Who is this torch runner? His Dragonite looks powerful. Ha 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 indeed. Well, it's a secret for now, don't worry he'll be here in a few minutes. We heard you were injured, are you alright sir? Ah yes. No need to worry it was just a small injury, one that can be fixed in no time. Brock, my boy, can you fetch for me Nurse Joy in the medical wing? Nurse Joy. Of course, I'd do anything to meet lovely Nurse Joy again. The man shouted out in excitement with love hearts in his eyes as he ran off towards the direction of the medical wing. Even she thought that reaction was a bit, weird, weird maybe a bit too weak to describe it. 
Wasn't that Brock the substitute gym leader of Pewter City? One reporter remarked, it was about time someone noticed. Yes, but he retired from his position in order to travel with the Torchrunner on his journey. I will give you a hint though. He's a rookie trainer that will leave a very, very big impression in this year's conference. Hmm, interesting. It looks like this torchbearer was going to be competing, and it sounds like he was one to watch out for amongst the other competitors. Then, the toll of the second bell could be heard, the torchbearer had arrived. Now sorry ladies and gentlemen, but can you please make way for the torch runner? A bit embarrassed, everyone other than Goodshow moved off the red carpet. Just around the corner, someone holding a torch made an appearance as they ran up the red carpet at very surprising speeds, she couldn't recognize him since his body was tilted towards the ground in a sprinting position and his red cap covered the remainder of his head with the Pikachu on his shoulders covering half of his face from one side of the carpet. Holy moly, this year's runner is fast. Fast was an understatement, he was running at speeds everyone thought only Pokemon could achieve, it was kind of amazing that the Pikachu on his shoulders was standing there with ease. A. N. To those who say running as fast a Pokemon should be impossible for Ash, I am chalking that up to aura enhancement, just think of aura as chakra without the elemental, nature attacks and all that. He ran up towards Goodshow, stopped immediately and brought out the torch towards President Goodshow. Here you go Mr. Goodshow, huff, huff hope I made it in time. You sure did lad. You still have half an hour left, what amazing progress, I was expecting you to barely arrive on time at best. She couldn't really see him with his back turned to her, from his height, you wouldn't think he was 10 years old, the age in which most rookie trainers set out. But in all seriousness, thank you, Naruto Uzumaki. She stopped breathing. Tomorrow we shall commence the lighting ceremony, we hope that you can all make it, he commented before leaving towards Nurse Joy who had just appeared alongside Brock but she didn't care at the moment, her whole attention was focused on the boy before her. I can't believe it, what is he doing here? In Kanto. XXXXX near some lodging XXXXX. So Naruto, how was the rest of the run? They were heading towards a lodging Brock had booked for both of them, his mom, Brock's family and Professor Oak, he had given the money to Brock a month earlier in order to book the first class lodging saved for the richer participants or the ones who had family coming. Uneventful. Though I did spot Jenny looking at my chest a couple of times, Brock was crying tears of jealousy at this notice, jokingly cursing at him for stealing Officer Jenny's heart. Oh did you see that hot girl gawking at you a few feet behind you, even after the crowd dispersed, she was looking at you like she was about to pounce on some fine piece of meat, Brock teased, why did he decide to travel with a first class pervert again? Seriously though, spending time with your Pokemon is fine and all, but have you ever thought about spending time with a girl? in the romantic way. Nah, not yet anyway, need to focus on my trainer career, he held a look of contemplation for a while. Oh, what's with that look, thinking back to your romantic days perhaps. No way pervert, but, there was one girl back in the day who I, may have adored, admired as more like it when I was in Kalos. Go on, Brock beckoned with his hand. She was, amazing, Brock giggled with a hand covering his mouth. Not in that way you pervert, I meant her way with Pokemon, in general, she was my idol, my role model, the one who I wanted to be in the future, she was absolutely perfect in everything, from her battling skills, her caretaking skills to her social skills, when I was young and foolish, I often wanted to be together with her, but that attraction, once I was old enough, changed to a desire for her recognition in skill. Brock nodded, but the smile on Brock's face told him that Brock though otherwise. She was my mom's only disciple after she retired and focused on family and business, my mom taught her everything, and she learned it quickly, a prodigy like no other, she even won the Kalos League Championship in her first year. I watched every move she made, every command she shouted, she was like a goddess of victory, she fought smart, hard and quick, she didn't lose a single Pokemon. And when she won the championship and held the cup, the look on her face was heavenly, he didn't notice Brock struggling so hard to hold in his laughter during his unconscious trance. Brock in the meantime was thinking oh if only there was a mirror here, he could see the look on his face, heck he probably wouldn't even realize it was there with that far off look in his face, he so still loves her, who the hell is this chick? We celebrated together, but in the next week, like most trainers she moved on, she had no family, we were her surrogate family so there was nothing there for her in Kalos, in the next two years while I was stuck in Kalos, she participated in the Sinnoh League, then the Johto League. What happened to the last two years? Brock asked. She stopped. Like in Kalos, she didn't lose once, people believed she would become the greatest trainer to ever exist, but by the third year, she went into the movie business. 
I think it was then that I wanted her to acknowledge me. I trained so hard so that I could show her that there is always someone better than her because I, wait, why I am even telling you this, he snapped out of his days just in time to prevent himself from revealing something rather personal, Brock, however had a knowing look on his face. Because you still totally have the hots for this girl and you need an outlet to release some sexual frustration. Brock teased, however at the same time he was blushing madly, Brock was contemplating something. Wasn't there a famous actress who had just resumed their Pokemon career this year? In the meantime he had seen something in the distance, closing in towards them at a breakneck pace or more accurately, towards him. Naruto. A feminine voice drawled out from the fast figure, it leapt up into the air towards him as a woman crashed into him and hugged the dear life out of him. M, Mom, I didn't think you would get here this fast. Of course, this is my dear son's debut after all. Thanks Mom. The more the merrier, he could use all the support he needed after all. Naruto. My boy, how has your month-long training been? Behind his mother, Professor Oak was running up to them. Hey Professor Oak, did you bring them? He was referring to the legendaries he had given to Professor Oak to research a bit on before the conference. After all he did promise Mew and Mewtwo that they would participate in the final and usually most toughest matches of the tournament, the three legendary golems preferred communicating with nature and their friends rather than competitive battling so they opted out. Yep, such magnificent Pokemon, thank you, Naruto, for giving me the opportunity of a lifetime, Oak handed him two Pokeballs, yeah, only two, the three golems refused to allow Oak to research them. Hey no problems, he looked down at his two beloved Pokeballs, even in their Pokeballs he could still feel the link between them, his bond with the Mew duo was just that strong. It's been a while Mew, Mewtwo. Indeed Naruto, how have you been? Mew, 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 Mew cried out in excitement, clearly missing him after being separated from him for the first time since they met. It's been a good month, it's nice to see you again too, Mew. I can't wait to see them in action, the crowd will be roaring magnificently once they see the two legendaries. It'll be sure to not disappoint. Let's forget all about this Pokemon business, his mom interrupted as she looked at him sternly I haven't seen my boy in months and it's about time he had some homemade food. Alright, there was nothing more delicious than his mom's cooking. Thanks for watching.